Hello, this is Roger Davison. Welcome to the Service Call Blueprint. Today, my guest is Chris Bishop. Chris is the owner of Davis Heating and Air in Rocky Mount, Virginia, and Michael Matheson, who is the owner of Matheson Heating in uh, the suburbs of Detroit, Michigan. Uh, and both of these gentlemen's business is heating and air conditioning. Uh, Michael does plumbing. Chris doesn't do much plumbing. Uh, but their, their businesses are totally different in terms of their geographical area. Chris's business is sort of in a rural area, and he has about a 75-mile radius that he has to cover, and he can't really shrink that down. Michael's business has been shrunk down and, and smaller, and what we're going to talk about today is operations around the service business after you make the sale. Uh, gentlemen, welcome to the service called Blueprint. Thank you. Michael, welcome. Thank you. Good. Uh, now, here's how we got here. Uh, Chris and I were talking one day about some of his specific issues around how to dispatch, how to, how to, how to do the service work after you get the work done. And uh, I've been telling Chris some certain things. That, well, have you got somebody that I can talk to that's, that's kind of gone through this? And that, so that's how we got here. So, so, Chris, I'd like for you to start out with some of your needs because this show is for both of you guys, not me. I'm just here to host. So, Chris, start out with some of your challenges and what, what would you like to ask Michael? Well, I think just being efficient as possible, our biggest issue is our labor percentage. Um, we're well above the national average. I uh, checked yesterday, we're about 32%, which is terrible. Um, our install labor is down at eight. Uh, we look really good there. We've always looked good on install labor, but our service labor, we've struggled with that, and that's been um, our BHAG. <laughs> my big hairy audacious goal is to get that down around 20% like we need it. Uh, I think the national average is 20 to 22%. And, you know, I need to drop that by 10%. That's a lot. And uh, that's been my struggle. I've fought it last year, all year, and then now we're dealing with it again this year. Sure. Ours is at 21%. Wow. Awesome. How many calls are you completing on the first visit? All of them. What's your percentage? All of them. Um, the only exception when the, when it comes to completing the call is there's two actually two exceptions. One, the customer has to reschedule for whatever reason they've got a plane to catch or somewhere to go. Two, if we have to order a compressor from Tyler, Texas, and it's going to take two to three days to get here. Other than that, we you know we're able to source things locally. So. Um, we, when we present our options to the customer, we they pick the, which option they want to go with. We take care of the paperwork first thing. That's um, take care of the payment, and then we go and get our parts. And um, we've got parts drivers that are available to run and go get the parts while the technician starts on on the work. So, what we found is the um, our technicians. We used to do it the old way where we would try to get to as many people as possible and the technicians would get there and they say, well, we need to get these, we don't have the parts on the truck. We need to get heat exchange. We need a compressor, whatever it may be. Um, I've got your model number, serial number. I'll get that back to the office. They'll make some phone calls. They'll source the parts. They'll give you a call with a price and then we'll give you a call to reschedule. Well, then we ended up with a binder like this of full of all these, what we call service quote worksheets. So when we made the changes two years ago, we sell the job, we get paid for the job, and before the technician even goes to present, just to take a couple steps back, they've already called and sourced the parts and found how much the parts are going to be, where they're going to get them from, and then when the customer says go ahead, it's just a matter of a phone call to the office to tell the, the parts driver to, to dispatch them to go get the parts. They start working on it, and they could be there depending on the level of service that the customer provides. They could be there anywhere from two hours to the rest of the day. So it's not uncommon for us to, for our technicians to call in at nine o'clock after they've got everything sorted out on their first call and they're going to be tied up till two o'clock. But they're also doing a, you know, a, a repair and it's going to be um, completed and paid for and then we move on to the next one. May I chime in? I, have, I want to chime in here because I want to remind Michael of something. I was with uh, John one morning uh and we were doing two service agreement fulfillments and it was one person two houses these 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 houses were seven hundred thousand 
uh, one person that one of the houses he lived in and the other house he rented. So we did the maintenance on the house that, that the couple lived in. And then we were doing the maintenance on the rental property, which is just a really nice piece of rental property. And Michael sent me a text and says, Hey, get out of there. Y'all are wasting time. Do you remember that, Michael? I don't, but it sounds typical. <laughs> <laughs> it's about nine thirty or 10. And uh, I sent him a text back and I said, would you leave us alone, please? We have a fish on the line and we're probably going to be here all day. Yeah. And John sold a top option, something. And it was really, and we were, the, he, we had to, we had to go get parts. We got back about one. And I, well, I just said, come get me. Cause he was all day. So he, we text dispatch and said, Hey, top option, uh, several thousand dollars. We'll be back. Uh, we won't be back. We're going, we're, we're, we're done for the day. Rescheduled, move all my calls, whatever. So he's done. He's had to grow through. That's when he was learning to slow down. Sure. But he's you know there. What? He's there now. There is a, um, a prime example. It's been a super cold winter. And are we busy? Yes. But it's not when it gets super cold. It's not where you're just spinning in the mud, not going anywhere. Where yes, we're busy. We have a, a larger call volume, but we're working through the calls methodically. Where our new our new term for this year is methodically thorough. We go through the calls methodically right from when the call comes in. We work through with the customer, get it taken care of, sell the job, do the do the job, and then move on to the next one. Um, so we're clearing as we go. So there's no loose ends, um, and our customers after you know we've been doing this for the two years now. They're starting to realize that you may have to wait a day or two for us to get there, but when we get there, you're our focus, our entire focus, and we're going to work with you to get that completed and not leave you to come back later. Before, the text would run 10, 20 calls a day. Yeah. What are you doing with uh, parts? Because we have parts houses 30 to 30 minutes to an hour away mm -hmm. in the county we work in, there's no HVAC parts houses. Uh, and we find that we have to have Linux parts ordered in the factory parts, uh, condensers, fan loaders specific. Uh, are you getting a lot of those parts just from the local parts house, just because you're in a larger city that you're able to just obtain those parts because they're stocking more larger warehouses? Sure. And you're just going and getting those parts and putting them on to where we have to wait one or two days to get them out, get them in. Sure. We, we know the, the common parts that we use, I'm sure as you do, we, you know, 80% of the parts that we need are on the truck. But for the 20% that we need to go get something, um, yes, those, you know, we're, we're within 45 minutes being a suburb of Detroit, we can get to those parts houses within 45 minutes. The, the, I think the, one of the major differences is though, is that we, um, when a customer selects an option is we take care of the paperwork, meaning we get paid. So before we go order parts in or we go chasing anything, we're, they're invested in the process. We've got our money. We order the parts when they come in and we go back. So we're already, you know, two steps into the process. The, only, the last step is just installing it by the time the part arrives. So the money's in the bank moving forward. Are you doing anything that, there's some parts that you're using that, you know, like pressure switches for a gas furnace or something that you're using that may be universal or you're doing some things like that that may help you get some of those calls done on the first visit yeah, we use instead the, uh, of having to run to a parts house. We use the um, glow fly igniters, which are um, pretty universal and they're very durable. Uh, we use the universal pressure switches. We also, we're a carrier dealer in the for 35 years, so we have a large base of carrier customers. So we know all the specific OEM parts for the carrier furnaces. But when we get outside of the carrier furnaces, um, we do use the um, universal pressure switches and we have the manometers with the pump on them so it can put the pressure on the switch and we can adjust it and dial it right in. Hmm. <clears throat> I'll have to look into that. Um, <clears throat> maybe you can send me an email with that manometer sure. with the pump on it. Yep. Anything else you think you may be using that that would help us obtain 
completing the calls on the first visit? Any any other universal uh, parts? You know, our you know, I, I can give you a, a list of our parts. There's probably about 30 of them that we keep in stock. Mm -hmm. um, you know, glower motors obviously are common with the um, with the capacitors, uh, Honeywell smart valves. Mm -hmm. um, standing pile, we still keep one on the shelf, but there's not a lot of those out there. The igniters cover a lot of base. We keep flame sensors in stock. Um, mm -hmm. Trying to think what else we, and so the inducer motor, the only inducer motors that we stock, because again, we're, we've are we been here 35 years with carrier alone, we've 70 years in business. But uh, we keep all the, the common carrier, which also cover for Brian, but uh, the inducer motors. Any other inducer motor, again, we're, we're fortunate in the fact that we are 20 to 30, 40 minutes away from suppliers, so we can get stuff readily on hand when we need it, so. You know, okay. where you're located, you may require a higher inventory than what we do. Um, but the quicker, the, the, the goal is, is to get the customer taken care of, get that job closed out, and not create any loose ends, as, as at least not as many loose ends as what we, you know, we used to do. So you're but, saying that <clears throat> before the tech even presents the option sheet, He's looking so he can advise the customer of when it'll be done. You're saying that they do the research, find out where the parts are, whether it can be completed today. If someone's going to get the parts, they build the sheet, then they go do the presentation, collect, and then from there, all you all you have to execute is the repair. Correct. Let me jump in here. There's a reason why Michael does that, and this is what you need to do. Michael has all of his sheets already built because he uses a, a cook cookbook, but the cookbook has levels. Let the, the technician has to determine if he can do the job while he's there because that determines the level of the expense of the job. So if the technician, the technician says, okay, here's the issue, here's the menu, now let me see if I got everything I need. And if he doesn't have everything he needs, he goes up to level two because that means we got to come back and it costs more money, so we got to charge more money. Okay. Yeah. To a point, um, you know, one thing if they go up, if they go up a level, um, we know. Well, the number one, we know what the basics are that we need. We know that we need an inducer motor and an igniter, whatever it may be. So then he presents those options. The customer then chooses, you know, whether they want to go with the band aid or the you know, up through the bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. And then at that point, let's say if they go with a higher level, then he's already done a thorough diagnosis of the furnace. So he knows that, yeah, the furnace is 12 years old, the inducer motor was bad, but the gas valve is gonna be the next on the list. Then depending on what level they go with, they'll determine what components to add to the package that's gonna best fit the customer's needs and their, um, you know, what they're what they want to accomplish the, the goal is and spending as much time as we do is that our callbacks are reduced we have a lot less callbacks than we were one than when we were running around tagging the base everywhere okay which that's a well, labor, labor percentage too huge that's that's where the labor gets out of hand going back well that and then i know that i'm not very uh familiar with your geographic area but we were running um, we had like a 40 mile radius and we've brought that into about a 12 mile radius. And, uh, we had a gentleman from another contractor from Atlanta come in and visit us. And he was amazed because he's seen, you know, our trucks, he's like, we were drove down the same roads all day long and we're passing trucks, Matheson trucks and everything else. As we go down those roads, you know, we were just focused right in where we were. And yeah, there are there really good jobs out 40, minutes to an hour away yes but by the time we get there if traffic's terrible then it takes that much time longer you know of windshield time and when we reduced our area it was difficult to do we we did we started it in priority zones but then we finally got it shrunk down and if somebody's out of our area we'll we have we have uh, on our dispatch for our csrs we have a map of our territory and then we have de dealers that we recommend i think there's five of them that surround us um, their carrier dealers, people that I've known for years. Um, so we would recommend those customers to those folks, but we stay focused right in our area and our business, it improved by, you know, increased by 30% over two years, just by focusing on a smaller area. 
Can What's the population in the area of that 12 miles, do you know? Oh, we're not in the city, but we're in the suburbs. I, I don't know that number specifically. Um, we are in the western, central western half of Oakland County. So we're kind of on the edge of, we're right in the middle between the city and the highly populated areas and then more of the country setting. Mm -hmm. If you go farther west, it's more of a, um, you know, more farmland and spread out. Can, can I jump in here? I need to have that gentleman come revisit you again because he hasn't let go completely and it's hard to do because sure. we're, we're still, we're still running. He's still running, but he has a, he's in a metropolitan area. Atlanta is much bigger than Detroit, but he, he needs to do what you, what you, you did. Uh, Chris's situation is so different in terms of just, right. there's nobody around his office. Right. I mean, with well, that that's, be that's how our, that's how we were, you know, hindsight being 2020 grandpa really picked the right spot to pick, you know, 70 years ago, but, you know, it really hasn't really became heavily populated until the, the construction boom in the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. So we're reaping the benefits of, of that. So, yeah, if you're remote, then you're going to have to travel more. But I would recommend, at the very least, find those areas that are profitable and those customers that fit your niche and then shrink as much as you can to save that drive time and, and laser your focus in as much as possible. Just the county we live in, 55,000 people with population is showing 56,159 where the county, the size of the county is 712 square miles for wow. 55,000 people. So that's, that's my spread. biggest problem. Um, yep. You know, where we're in Roanoke County and there's um, 251 square miles and there's about two or 300,000 people there. And that's, you know, we're trying to get, um, you know, focus more into that area because, you know, we can cover less ground and take care sure. of more customers. Yeah, it's definitely a challenge that, uh, I have a question. You mentioned something about when we get the call, we, we, we really work through that call before we go. Yes. I, I want you to speak to that a lot. Tell us what that looks like. Explain that to Chris. I've explained it to him, but I want him to hear you say it. Well, we, we even go every morning we have the text come into the office and we do a uh, role play of it. We have a script based system that we use for presenting our options. Um, so we're trying to get those processes down as much as possible, just like McDonald's or anywhere else we'd go without, you know, to make sure and also to make sure that we have a high value of uh, customer service. But I'm not when we come in in the morning, the guys will find out what their first call is and then they'll role play that call with another technician. So before they even get onto the, on the on the front doorstep, they've already ran through a possible presentation for that customer and are geared up and ready to go. Um, and then again, we're just methodically thorough as to when we go through the system, we take the time to really pull things apart, pull blower motors, inspect heat exchangers, you know, really dig down deep into it and um, make sure that we cover all the bases. Talk about the methodical process to figure out which call to give that technician. I mean, that's methodical. You mean based on skill levels or? Based upon what kind of relationship you have with the customer and what the sense of urgency is for the call. Yeah, I mean, we, we know our, obviously, you know, the techs that, that work with you and they have their different uh, personalities and whatnot. We know our customers pretty well. Um, so we do try to match technicians up to the customers as best as possible. Um, we've got a one technician that does strictly, uh, unless we're super busy, he'll do um, maintenance tune-ups. Um, so we, we divide them out that way. Um, but then of course, when it comes to, to skills where everybody's growing in their skills, so we make sure that we challenge the guys and we'll send a, a lead tech with a, this maybe specializes in heat pumps to go with a, another tech that, uh, doesn't know as much and he'll train him on, on site and stuff like that. What about, uh, what about the process that the dispatcher does? You know, one person answers the phone, dispatch is always on the phone, especially when you're busy doing outbound calls, trying to categorize and prioritize the calls. Talk to me more about that. Okay. So the, uh, are you referring to the one that we have the CSR that takes the phone calls mm -hmm. and she inputs them in the computer, they go to the dispatcher 
and of course they've already been prioritized you know if they're outside of our area we refer them to somebody to another company that we recommend um, then they come in if it's super busy then we'll take our our you know war our current customers warranty issues maintenance agreement customers always come first um, and then from that point then they're divided up based on you know what their needs are and, and what their requirements are for how soon they need to get things done yeah but I, I remember when I was there back uh, last summer and the first hot day we had we booked a hundred calls the first day or something and yes. we had we only had three technicians because three technicians were out due to death and the family and some other issues it was a nightmare mm -hmm. I was there to observe and immediately had to get on the phone and help and so we had we, here's what we had. We had two people answering the phone, me and the CSR. Plus, we had to get Mike's wife to come in to input information, input that data into the computer. And then the dispatcher was calling people, prioritizing calls and referring stuff out because there was no way we could get to 100 calls with three technicians. And But we had really had to sift through, okay, where's the important stuff here? But right. that's really kind of like uh, – uh, triage day it's not like that all the time that's just right. that's really unusual work you worked through that in a week and a half and got through that right. um but uh but on a, on a normal day one people are taking the calls and booking them and not giving time slots or schedules just will be there today or tomorrow but that that particular week it was like man we're out till friday because right we, we, were, we weren't even going to be able to get there friday we're going to have to call figure out who to who to who to put off even more, but, but the dispatchers, man, she's not doing anything but talking to techs and talking to customers, outbound calls. Right. Tell me what's wrong. Are you sure? What's the temperature in the house? I mean, it's really a qualifying process and you're still doing a good job with that, aren't you, Michael? Oh yeah. That's going really well. The, um, that's what I wanted you to speak to. Yeah. We don't still... just blindly go to a call. No, we, we prioritize, work them through, find out exactly what their needs are. You know, obviously, if in the, during the winter time, if they have heat, and it's an it's a it's something with the humidifier, we'll let the customer know that we need to take care of our customers that don't have heat first, and people understand. Um, and I remind our CSR and our dispatcher too that when it's super cold out, and and we've you know for our customers, we got it. It's going to be two to three days before we get out there. They're going to call anywhere else, and it's going to be six to seven days. So. Um, you know, we put them on the priority list, but no matter where you call, it's, you just got to realize that there's going to be a delay. Um, and we just do the best that we can. And we, it's a, again, it's a triage. But the one thing that we don't do is, that, like in the past, we would go and try to take every call that came in and go tag the base. So yeah. now we've got all these loose ends out there. Just so, so we're trying to please everybody and we're absolutely pleasing no one and just making everybody frustrated. The techs are tired. They're spinning their wheels. They're not getting anything done. All we're doing is going out, tagging the base, and putting the repair down. You know, if they can't fix it immediately right there, then the repair goes back, and we, you know, we have to go back and fix it later when we have time. Um, the problem with that is we get a, we used to get a ton of callbacks. Customer satisfaction goes down. Um, you know, your costs go up. So yeah, we're real selective as to uh, how we bring those calls in and how we manage them. And, Make sure the customer gets taken care of. Any other questions, Chris? Because I've got a few, but I didn't want to take over. <laughs> no, go ahead. I'm I'm taking it all in. <laughs> okay. Um, I want you to speak to this issue. We got to go back. Who are you going to send back? That's a good good question. Um, we send the tech back that sold the job. So if Trevor sells in a, a repair and we've got to order the stuff in from Texas or we've got to you know, reschedule for the customer's reasons, then when they reschedule, that's assigned to Trevor. He knows what's going on. He knows what, what he, what, what's going on intelligence wise with the, with the job. He knows what needs to be deployed. He knows what needs to be taken care of to get the job done to, his expectations and the customer's expectations. Um, Is there ever a time that you break that rule? There are exceptions. I mean, when obviously if somebody's sick or, um, but we make sure that we communicate back and forth and brief and make sure that customer's getting what they're expecting. Um, and then some, and, uh, 
Now, I've heard the dispatcher at your office say this. Ah, Trevor's got to do that job. He's not here. I'm going to have to call the customer and tell him it's not going to be today. That's happened as well. Yep. I've heard that. And I was impressed by that. And she made the call. Customer was fine. But if the customer pushed back, we'd have probably done something different. Yeah, absolutely. But oh, the, the rule is that we want to make sure that the tech that was there that sold the, the job goes back and does that repair. Saves a lot of miscommunication and frustration. So, Chris, what I want you to hear is that that dispatcher's job is is she doesn't have time to take a lot of inbound calls. She does, but she ain't got a lot of time. She's busy outbound calling. Right. Michael. Finding, looking for that job that's going to be very profitable, plus making sure we take care of our good relationships and making sure we take care of the urgent things and putting the non-urgent things off. Like my unit's not keeping up. Okay, well, we got other people without heat. we got to catch them first. And then she works through that. Or I got no heat upstairs. Well, how many systems you got? Well, I got two. How old are they? Call all kinds of questions. Okay, what's the temp? So you're okay in your master suite. Who's upstairs? You know, you work through all that stuff. What? How many CSRs do you have compared to technicians? What is your ratios there? One dispatcher? How many techs? We have uh, an idea. Six technicians and two plumbers, and we have one CSR and one dispatcher. Yeah. They sit in the same room. And they've got scripts, so they, you know, they, they're trained to get the, give the information and get the information and move to the next call. So when we do get slammed, you know, we'll pick up the phone, but we don't, we'll put them on, we'll put the customer on hold, ask them to hold for just a moment, and then the CSR and you know, they'll, they'll, they work through that, through their process and grab the calls. Chris, Chris, the script is on a sheet of paper, and uh, we're fixing to run out of time here. The script is on a piece of paper, and it's really simple. I mean, the call comes in, I get the, I get the pad, and I go through and fill it out, da-da-da-da-da, and give it to her, gave it to her up front and put it in the computer. It's really, and if without that script, I'd have got off track because, oh, uh, I got it. I mean, I didn't read it, but it helped me. Especially when it gets busy, and you know now they, they obviously they know the scripts, but uh, yeah, so they just work it through, and everything's done by the process. Okay. We got we got nine minutes, so we go for nine more minutes and just figure it out. Any any other questions? I... What um, on your equipment and the things you're doing? Are you just taking care of your customers' systems you've installed over the years? Or do you take on any customer? How, how do you do that? Do you um, no, we, we take new customers all the time. Um, always growing the customer base. Um, but we do have longstanding relationships with our existing customers. We've got customers that we've installed four or five systems for. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, with it, and we get referrals for those custom, for, for new customers from, their, from our current customers and always growing, absolutely. Okay. We grow, we're, our, we're focused on not growing just for the sake of growing. We just want to, we want to grow in a managed way and in a methodically thorough way. So we have a plan set in place for that we're going to, you know, we've, in fact, we've, we don't hire any technicians that are, that have been in the field for a long time or have been around the, around the block. We focus on, um, we have our farm team, so to speak. So we have a lot of, a third of our company is um, millennials from 18 to 30, and we're training them. We've got mentor, we're doing mentoring with, with the older, with, with the lead techs and the lead installers and teaching those guys right from the ground up. Um, that way, when we, we get people that are grown right in the way that we do things and that we like to do things, they don't have any bad habits. Um, it's a lot, we find it's, all, it's, it's challenging, but it's a lot easier to work with with millennials and the in the new generation to to get them focused and keyed in on on the things that our values and our um, the way we operate. That's that's yeah. called you have to bend the sapling early, right? You just, once they're grown, man, you can't bend them. Oh yes, I've tried. It'll it'll wear you out. You you've experienced that too, Chris. So it, one of the other things too is if you've got a good technician that's in the field chances are they're probably not looking for a job. They're happy where they're at. And 
and moving forward. So if they've been with the company for 20, 30 years, it's, you know, there's a reason. Mm -hmm. so we, just, we, we just decided several years ago that we just need to, to have our own farm team. Okay. A lot of days it's like, most days it's like running a Boy Scout troop, but that's not such a bad thing either. So they're learning and learning about work and learning about life and, you know, we help them along the way. So mm -hmm. we've got their back, they've got our back kind of thing. All right. Well, if you don't mind, send me that e email. Um, I can give that to you or Roger can get it to you, but um, on some of those parts and, and then... I like the analogy of tagging base. Uh, we do that some uh, more than what we need to be. And I, th I think with just focusing on some of those things, I, uh, sure. I feel like we can, we can you know, narrow some of that down. Well, one thing too is the, um, when it's busy and there's a, like we talk about, there's those two, three weeks out of the year where it's super hot, super cold. And we're going to be running till seven, eight o'clock at night to manage the, the influx of calls, but 90% of the time, our technicians, they start at 7.30 and they're home by 4, 4.30, and they've maybe only done two, three, four calls a day. Hmm. Um, but their average tickets are no longer $130. They're, you know, four or $500, and um, customers are super happy. They've got a job that's installed or, you know, that's repaired properly. Time's been taken, and, uh, they're happy. We're happy. There's fewer callbacks and um, the techs are happy. They're not burnt out. They, we realize that they've got a life and they need to be with their family. They need to go to the kids baseball game or the, the, the dance class or recital. And we respect that. So um, they have a life and, you know, but they understand too, that when the, when the chips are down and we need to, we need to move and it's minus six out and people are without heat, we get them taken care of. Okay. And we get a lot of um, a lot of referrals from our service department. Not as much as we did since we started offering options, but they go to our sales department. And um, if even if installation is backed up, um, you know, if, during the, the coldest of winters, it may be a, you know 24, 48 hours before we can get out there to install a new furnace for them. We even have a program where we have uh, space heaters that we deploy with. Uh, they have a smoke alarm on them and everything, but we deploy two or three space heaters to the customer. They love it. They get, they've got some heat to get them through. And, um, that's the band aid stay with us. Yeah. That's the, that's the, we go touch base. That's a, I, that's how you're touching base with some of those people. Yeah. How many parts runners do you have? Two. And you run parts sometimes I know cause you've been in that college where you, cause um, not so much anymore. We pretty much got it pretty well organized to where, the guys know where to go and things are taken care of quickly. And um, sometimes the technician just goes and gets the parts. I know that that is yeah. everybody pitches in. The The main question is, is uh, yeah, everybody pitches in right from running parts to cleaning the toilets, to installing furnaces. Um, but the key is, is the question that we ask the tech is, do you have any work that you can do while you're waiting for your parts? No, I'm pretty much at a standstill. I've got everything tore apart. I need to get parts X, Y, and Z before I can do anything. All right, well, we look at it then, and it's going to be okay in an hour before we can get a parts driver out there. Go, go. There's no sense sitting in the truck. Drive to the parts house, get the parts, and go back and finish your job. And um, who, who makes that call? That's the dispatcher. Um, yeah, that's the dispatcher who takes care of that. Yep. And, the, and there's communication because the dispatcher yes. knows. So it's a, it's a there's problem. always that communication. What do you do? You have any work to do right now? And if that answer is yes, then somebody in the company will get the call to go run apart, whether it be a sales guy or whoever's free, and we go and get it taken care of. But that doesn't happen terribly too much. So, Michael, did you build all your sheets, or how did you? Uh, come about your option sheets we use the uh we started with um matt cope from the new flat rate mm -hmm. um two years ago we went all in with them um don't regret it we have very very seldom do we even get a complaint um maybe three or four a year and uh and then it's just a matter of communicate it's a communication issue typically um but we try not to, and that's more than just the menu pricing that you from that's a whole system and process. So that's where our scripts come from and our presentations and our role plays and 
we're very satisfied with with that system and we can park it great for you yep but everybody believes in it too right and you know we started out we, were, we went like i said we went all in they came in and trained us we had roger out training with us um and they recommend do role plays every morning we do role plays every morning it's two years in and they every morning they get their first call and role play that call and uh works good okay Guys, we're going to have to wrap this up. We've got less than a minute. Um, I appreciate both of you guys coming in today. I hope, uh, Chris, I hope you learned something. Michael, I really appreciate you uh, sharing with us. I think we should do this again. I think it's going to be great. But anyway, I, I thank you guys for joining the service call Blueprint today. And um, we're out of time. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Take care.